Upon booting up your console and seeing that black background with the white text across it reading the word Squaresoft, you knew you were in for a good time. It was like a little seal of approval for the game's quality and the type of experience you were about to get. Few things got me as excited as a kid as starting up a new game and seeing that little logo along with its red triangle pop up. For a company called Squaresoft, I like how they emphasized a triangle in their logo instead of a, well, square, but that's besides the point. The point being that Squaresoft was an absolute legend in the 90s, putting out classic after classic of top tier JRPGs. The amounts of games they released this decade, along with the ones that ended up being extremely amazing, is pretty staggering and mind-blowing to be honest. Most developers would put out a handful of games a year, but only like half of them would be that good. Squaresoft on the other hand though, they would put out like 5 to 10 huge RPGs per year, and most of them are still considered classics to this day. I mean, you got the bulk majority of the Final Fantasy games up until 9, Super Mario RPG, Chrono Trigger and Chrono Cross, Xenogears, the Mana series, the Saga series, the Front Mission series, and yeah, I could keep going. It truly is crazy how many quality titles they were able to put out in such a short amount of time. Their output alone is a massive factor why the 90s and early 2000s are often considered the golden era of JRPGs. This won't really be a comprehensive look of Squaresoft's entire history as they did start in the 80s. Instead, it's just going to focus on their peak in the 90s and some of my favorites from that generation. If you guys do want to see a video about Squaresoft's history though, or just the history of Final Fantasy, let us know in the comment section. As the title of the video implies, and as is obvious by the content we usually cover on this channel, I'm only going to focus on their RPGs during this time period as well. I know they delved into some other genres like fighting with Bushido Blade and Tobol No. 1, and racing with titles like Racing Lagoon, but yeah, we won't be discussing those here. Last thing. When talking about release dates, I'm only going to be referring to their Japanese release date, as if I mentioned the North American and European ones as well, it would just get repetitive and take up more time. Now, with all that said, let's take a deeper look at the absolute RPG magic that was Squaresoft in the 90s. Their first RPG of the decade was Final Fantasy III, released on April 27th, 1990. This was only released in Japan at the time and wouldn't make it to North America or Europe until much later on. It's a quality game and a natural evolution from the first Final Fantasy, as Final Fantasy II kind of took a radical departure in some design mechanics. But yeah, for the time, there was certainly a lot of depth in Final Fantasy III. The class system is very robust and a lot of fun. Coming out later that year would be Final Fantasy Legend 2 for the Game Boy, which is actually the second Saga game. I just didn't want to try to pronounce its original Japanese name to avoid sounding like a dumbass. Anyway, it's an interesting turn-based RPG that was received pretty well when it came out. June 1991 would bring us the first game in the Mana series, Seiken Densetsu, otherwise known as Final Fantasy Adventure in North America. This was a fun little action RPG for the Game Boy, and was a nice precursor for what was to later come in that series. In the next month of July that year, Final Fantasy IV would make its debut on the Super Famicom, and this is where things really started to get good. This was actually called Final Fantasy II in North America, considering we never actually got the second or third game here. But yeah, in official terms, it is the fourth game. Final Fantasy IV was really ahead of its time and kind of set the mold for story-driven JRPGs going forward. Most JRPGs before this were pretty light on story. It wasn't until this game came out that more character-driven and narrative-focused RPGs started becoming the norm. The story follows a Dark Knight Cecil, as he journeys to stop a powerful sorcerer from collecting crystals and destroying the world. This is a fan favorite in the series and still considered one of the best the franchise has to offer. December of that year would bring us Final Fantasy Legend 3 for the Game Boy, which was the third game in the Saga series. They were really hammering out Saga games during this time, as a whole new sub-series within that series called Romancing Saga would make its debut for the Super Famicom in January 1992. This was a lot more non-linear than all the other previous titles in the series, and to an extent is kind of like the first open world JRPG. Like you really get the freedom to do whatever the hell you want in this game, even from the beginning. Being the first of its kind, they were definitely exploring a lot of ideas here, and not all of them work that well, but I have to give them props for having that ambition and doing what they set out to do. 
we also wouldn't see an English release of this game until much later on. Later that year, the infamous Final Fantasy Mystic Quest would come out for the Super Nintendo. I say infamous because it's, uh, very polarizing you could say. It was basically designed as an entry-level JRPG for beginners, for better or for worse. I'm sure those that played it as a young tyke have some good memories of it, but for the older gamers that were expecting something more serious after Final Fantasy IV, they were probably pretty disappointed, and I think the critic reception at the time reflects that. It didn't score very well, and the only thing it was really praised for was its music, which is pretty good. So yeah, its reputation remained a little lukewarm among fans these days. It was also the first Final Fantasy game to be released in Europe, which in hindsight probably wasn't the best introduction to the series, but at least it finally made it over there. Thankfully, a couple months later in December, Final Fantasy V would release for the Super Famicom to much better reception. Story-wise, it wasn't quite as epic as 4, and was a little lighter in that regard, kind of like 3, or kind of like a mixture of 3 and 4, actually. The class system, which was absent from Final Fantasy IV, made its way back bigger than ever. Of course, this would only release in Japan at the time, and wouldn't come out in North America or Europe until the PlayStation version many years later. This next one's not really a true RPG, as it's more of a real-time strategy game, but Hanjuku Hero would come out just a couple weeks after Final Fantasy V. I'm really only including this game here because, oddly enough, I own it physically. I had never even heard of the game and just bought it on a total whim in Japan a few years back after I saw the Squaresoft logo on the box and its whopping price tag of $5. I was like, shit, I don't want to lose money on this. I don't know what the fuck it is, but I'm going to buy it anyway. Plus, just look at how adorable that box art is. Quirky 90s Japanese aesthetic at its finest. Moving on, August of 1993 would bring us the ever-loved Secret of Mana. This was an action RPG on the Super Nintendo, with incredibly charming and vibrant graphics. There's three characters to play as in this game, and it even has couch co-op to play with a friend. That aspect, plus the visuals and amazing OST, are probably the things remembered most fondly about the game. Depending on who you ask, the gameplay might be considered a little bit dated these days, so if you don't have the nostalgia for it like some others do, it may not hold up the best in that regard. In its defense, this is a criticism that applies to a lot of early action RPGs. Technology just wasn't out of place yet for these to shine back then. A few months later in December that year, Romancing Saga 2 would come out for the Super Famicom. This improved upon the original a lot while still keeping the open world nature from the first game. Unfortunately, it never made it out of Japan back then and wouldn't see an English release in some more recent years. The following year, on April 2nd, 1994, Squaresoft would release the universally praised Final Fantasy VI, otherwise known as Final Fantasy III in North America. This was an absolute hit, both in Japan and overseas. Its mature story and writing really were leaps and bounds above the competition at this time. You know what I was saying earlier about how Final Fantasy IV was the first RPG to really give us a deep story and character-driven narrative? Well, Final Fantasy VI is like that times 10. I didn't play this one until much later on in college, many years after its initial release, and I remember being extremely impressed with just how strong the writing was and how deep some of the plot themes were. The whole Ghost Train segment really had me like, damn, I think I get all the praise for this game now. It really was ahead of its time. In addition to this, Final Fantasy VI was unlike any previous Final Fantasy title before it, with its huge cast of 14 playable characters, the biggest in the series to this date, and having some more steampunk influence instead of strictly medieval fantasy. All of these factors, plus the of course incredible music, really makes Final Fantasy VI a special and memorable experience that is often considered one of the best, if not the best title in the entire Final Fantasy series. Personally, that honor belongs to Final Fantasy IX for me, but VI is definitely up there, and I can totally see why some others would have it as their favorite, especially if you grew up with it. August of that same year would bring us the super unique title, Live a Live. In my opinion, this is easily one of the best Squaresoft titles that is still yet to receive an official English translation, if not the best even. I mean, there are fan translations, so the game is plenty playable if you know what you're doing, but still. Anyway, you play as seven very different characters in their own individual scenarios before they join forces later in the game. And when I say very different, I mean very different. 
There's a martial arts master trying to find his next protege, a drifting gunslinger, a caveman, a robot, and yeah, pretty unique stuff. The structure of their scenarios play out a lot differently as well, ranging from stuff like stealth missions to tournaments, and even just regular JRPG type stuff. It's a good time. Combat-wise, it had a much different battle system compared to most other Squaresoft RPGs, as it took place over more of a grid-based battlefield while still being turn-based. As far as I know, there's not really another battle system out there that's just quite like it. It's pretty cool. Alright, before we go on to 1995, let me just say, up until this point, Squaresoft had been a very solid and respectable company. They had given us multiple classics already, and that was no easy feat. With that said, however, 1995 marked the turning point where they are about to leave the ranks among mortal men and ascend to godhood. The number of classics they started putting out after this year was absolutely mind-blowing. Starting with Front Mission on February 24th. Squaresoft actually teamed up with another developer for this game, G-Craft, so you could say this one kind of has an asterisk. It's a grid-based tactical RPG involving mechs and was the start of a fairly popular series. Of course, like many Squaresoft titles back then, this one wouldn't see a North American release until much later on on the Nintendo DS. Fortunately, the next month would bring us a game that eventually would see a North American release, and thank god it did, because the game I'm referring to is none other than the absolute classic Chrono Trigger, widely considered one of the best, if not the best, JRPG of all time. I mean, you had the creators of Final Fantasy, Dragon Quest, and Dragon Ball all working together on the same project. With that type of team behind it, there's no way this one wasn't going to be incredible. It's an extremely charming, time-traveling adventure, with a colorful cast of characters, really good pacing, and a super fun battle system. Oh, and let's not forget the amazing OST. Legit, one of the best video game soundtracks ever, in my opinion. Yasunori Matsuda absolutely poured his heart and soul into this one, and it definitely shows. There's just so many iconic and memorable tracks. This is one of my favorite RPGs ever, and it's really short 20 to 25 hour runtime just makes it a blast to replay these days. Look, I could go on about this game forever, but I feel like I've talked about it a lot recently, like in our videos about campfires, RPGs that have aged well, and yeah, we've given it a lot of love before. Later that year in September, the third game in the Mana series, Second Densetsu 3, would be released. This was basically just a bigger and better version of Secret of Mana combat was smoother, there were way more playable characters and ones you could only get on certain playthroughs encouraging a lot of replayability, and even better graphics. Despite Secret of Mana being pretty popular, unfortunately, to the dismay of many fans, this one never got an English release back then. Thankfully, recent years have fixed that with the Trials of Mana collection, but still, it was a travesty that it took so long. Before that, I remember playing this on an emulator with my brother back in the day, and it was a really fun time. There's nothing like some good old couch co-op. One month later, Secret of Evermore would be released in North America, but not in Japan oddly enough. A different North American branch of Square actually worked on this one instead of their main team, and it remains the only one they ever made. Despite having a lot of similarities to Secret of Mana, it's actually its own thing and not related to it at all. A lot of people thought we got this game instead of Trials of Mana back in the day, but that's not the case. They were two separate projects worked on by two separate teams. Between all of the American pop culture references, the time-traveling mechanic, and the atmospheric music of Jeremy Soule, later known for composing the soundtracks for the Elder Scrolls series and many, many more, it gives the game this distinctly different feel and vibe compared to most other RPGs back then. It's certainly one unique experience. The final RPG of 1995 would be Romancing Saga 3. Romancing Saga 3 is definitely the most polished and prettiest game in the series, but it also may have played it the safest as well, as it's the least experimental one of them all. For better or for worse. If you feel like I'm brushing over the Romancing Saga games kinda quickly, it's because, well, I am. Despite the title intriguing me as a kid, I just never really played them that much, so don't have much to say about them. I think their more obtuse nature and less traditional JRPG structure just confused my stupid 10 year old brain and went over my head. I'd probably come to like it now, so I do need to check them out. To start off 1996, we would get Radical Dreamers on February 3rd. 
This one was not really an RPG and more of a text-based adventure. It was never officially released outside of Japan either, as it came out for the Satellaview, which was kind of like a weird satellite peripheral add-on for the Super Famicom. This was a spin-off of Chrono Trigger and served as huge inspiration for the sequel that would later come out, Chrono Cross. It basically served as a very rough foundation for Chrono Cross, as the main scenario writer, Masato Kato, wanted to explore some more of these characters and ideas. It follows the adventure of Surge, Kid, and a character named Gil, who was later confirmed by Kato to be Magus from Chrono Trigger, as they infiltrate Viper Manor. Those who have played Chrono Cross will definitely recognize the name Surge and Kid, as they're the two main characters there. But yeah, I just thought this one was an interesting footnote in the Chrono series history and was worth mentioning. Plus, the name just really captivated me as a kid. Radical Dreamers just sounds so 90s and mysterious. I love it. The first real RPG Squaresoft would give us that year would be Bahamut Lagoon a week later. This was a really interesting strategy RPG where you fought with dragons on floating islands. You even raised dragons in a sort of simulation-like aspect. It's a very gorgeous game and the effects still look great to this day. The premise just looked so cool and was honestly the first Japanese-only Squaresoft game to really catch my eye as a kid when I discovered the world of emulation. I think it was the first one out of that bunch that I played actually. We did talk about this game in our video about 8 grey JRPGs that never left Japan, so that's a good one to check out if you're really intrigued by it. February of that year would end up being an insane month for Squaresoft as the end of it would also bring us the title Front Mission Gun Hazard. Like the first Front Mission game, this one was also co-developed by another team. This team being Omiya Soft this time. Unlike the first Front Mission though, this one was not a strategy RPG and was an action RPG instead. It's a really great game that never saw an official English release and is easily one of the best of its kind on the Super Nintendo. Just a couple weeks later on March 9th, a very special game to me would be released called Super Mario RPG Legend of the Seven Stars. I have so much to thank this game for. It's the first RPG I ever played and the game that got me into the genre before I even knew what the genre was back then. I didn't even know other games existed like it out there and just thought it was like a unique, one of a kind game. Which in a lot of aspects, I guess, it really is. It combined the fun platforming of Mario with the strategic turn-based battle system and just absolutely hooked me in. The timed button mechanics really added a lot to combat. To my knowledge, it may have even been the first turn-based RPG to do something like this. Combine this with the super charming, vibrant world, and incredibly catchy music, and you have a timeless classic on your hands. I was so obsessed with this game as a kid that my mom would even hide it from me if I either played it too much or just got in trouble. The only game she ever really did that with. I also played this game a lot with my dad back then, as he would help me get past some tough fights that I was too stupid to beat. So yeah, I just have so many memories with this game. It truly was a magical experience. The last two RPG Squaresoft would give us in 1996 would be Treasure of the Redras and Treasure Hunter G. Yeah, I guess they really liked the word treasure that year. To no one's surprise, these never got North American releases either, but luckily this is a trend that would stop with the next console generation. Treasure Hunter G was a pretty fun little action RPG with a bit of a lighter story and premise compared to most other Squaresoft RPGs back then. Treasure of the Redras was more of a traditional JRPG, just with some pretty unique elements. The plot incorporates some aspects of various Indian religions and is split up into three different scenarios with three different main characters. The magic system is probably the most unique part about it though. You combine different words together to create mantras, which are basically just spells, that all have ranging effects. There's so many different combinations to find, it's really cool. Treasure of the Redras also marked the last game Squaresoft would release for the Super Famicom. For as amazing of a run Squaresoft had on the Super Nintendo, it's pretty lame that we never got the last title they actually made for it, but it is what it is. Fortunately, the PlayStation would see an end to the era of them not localizing a lot of their best RPGs. You might find yourself asking, what changed? why they just now decide to start bringing them all over? Well, my friends, I have just three simple words to that question. Final Fantasy VII. To say Final Fantasy VII was a hit would be an understatement. It took the entire gaming world by storm and put JRPGs on the map. 
Like Super Mario RPG was for me, I'm sure this was many people's first introduction to the genre. Squaresoft made a massive marketing push for this one, and it definitely paid off. If you had a PlayStation, there was a good chance you either owned or at least played this game. Speaking of PlayStation though, you might have noticed how Squaresoft moved from a Nintendo console to a Sony one this generation. Well, there's a reason for that. Despite cartridges not having the technical power to house gigantic RPGs, or FMV sequences really, Nintendo didn't want to budge from them for some reason and refused to get with the times. Enter Sony. A new competitor in the console market with the very new CD-ROM technology. Unlike cartridges, these did have the power to house massive RPGs, so needless to say, Squaresoft was pretty intrigued as they weren't going to be able to achieve the full scope of what they wanted on the 64. It just wasn't powerful enough. So with that huge issue among some other vague drama, Squaresoft and Nintendo officially cut ties and Squaresoft would exclusively make games for the PlayStation instead. As much as I love Nintendo, this really was the best possible decision they could have made. Like, can you imagine Final Fantasy 7 through 9 without all the amazing CGI cutscenes? Obviously, the games as a whole were excellent in their own right, but those FMV sequences were so immersive and easily one of the most memorable parts about them. Plus, they ended up rekindling their friendship later, so it all had a happy ending anyway. Everyone won. So yeah, with Final Fantasy VII, Squaresoft was off to a phenomenal start on the PlayStation. It showed them that there was indeed a market for JRPGs outside of Japan. 1997 would be the beginning of a new era and a new legacy. Later that year in June, the fan favorite, Final Fantasy Tactics, would be released. As the name implies, this was a grid-based tactical RPG, much different than any other Final Fantasy game before it. Considering we never got any of Squaresoft's other tactical RPGs, like Bahamut Lagoon, Treasure Hunter G, and Front Mission, I believe this is the first one we ever got in the West. From Squaresoft, at least. I'm pretty sure it was the first one I ever played, and I'm sure I'm not alone. The story was very mature and political, which may have gone over my head a little bit as a kid, but as an adult now, I've really come to appreciate just how strong the writing is in this game. It's absolutely top-notch, and easily one of the best stories in the entire Final Fantasy series. The next month of July would bring a Saga Frontier, the newest game in the Saga series. Much like the previous Saga games, this one really doesn't play out like a traditional JRPG. There's seven different protagonists you can play as in this game, and you're encouraged to beat all their scenarios. To be honest, I never really played this one or its sequel that much, so I don't have a whole lot to say about them. They were just a little too out there for me as a kid. I was just used to a general JRPG structure, and these did not have them. In September 1997, Front Mission 2 would be released, but not in America. This was also a tactical RPG and seemed to improve upon the original in many ways, so I've heard at least. I've never actually played it for obvious reasons. I don't even think a fan translation exists of this one yet, but let me know if I'm wrong. The last sort of RPG we would get that year would be Chocobo's Mystery Dungeon. But not in America, of course, just in Japan. It's essentially just a roguelike before roguelikes were that popular. Just with a Final Fantasy setting and characters, obviously. Moving on in 1998, February would bring us one of my all-time personal favorites, Xenogears. Xenogears has a pretty interesting development history, you could say. It was created by the husband and wife duo, and forgive me if I'm butchering this, Tetsuya Takahashi and Kaori Tanaka. For those that are fans of Monolith Soft and their Xenoblade games, Takahashi is actually the one to create that company. Pretty cool stuff. Anyway, it was initially pitched as an idea for Final Fantasy VII, and actually started development as that, until it was deemed too dark for their flagship series. At one point, it was also supposed to be a sequel to Chrono Trigger, but obviously that never panned out either. Regardless, it was still greenlit to be developed as its own project. It was given a two-year development time, which they apparently did not manage very well, as they had to majorly rush the second disc of content in order to make Deadline. This resulted in a vastly different second disc than the first disc, with a lot more narration and reading. So yeah, in some people's eyes, it's a little incomplete in that regard, but in my opinion, it just makes it a flawed masterpiece. It does still tell the complete story anyway. It's an incredibly deep and epic, sci-fi, fantasy, steampunk RPG where you fight against gods and shit and giant mecha robots. 
is pretty fucking awesome. There's a lot of religious elements, and even psychological ones, inspired by the works of Sigmund Freud and people like that. In fact, the religious tones were so prominent that it almost didn't see a North American release because of them. It's actually the reason why I originally wasn't allowed to play it as a kid when I first heard of it. I remember the dude at EB Games just told my mom that it was way too anti-religious, dark, and mature for a stupid little kid like me. Of course, that only made me want to play it even more, so eventually my mom caved. Being like 11 when I first played this, I didn't really know what the fuck was going on, but all the references and big words just made me feel like I was playing something pretty fucking deep. Outside of the story, it's also got really great characters and perhaps the biggest, most fleshed out cast of villains that I've ever seen in a JRPG. The music was also composed by Yasunori Mitsuda, his second project after Chrono Trigger, and is pretty damn amazing. Very memorable tracks for sure. Given my love and nostalgia for this game, I would really love to eventually cover this one in more detail, but I need to move on to other games so this video is not like an hour long. I really can't say enough good things about it though. One month later on March 29th, Parasite Eve would be released. It was a lot different compared to pretty much any other Squaresoft RPG up until this point, as it took place in modern times in the real-life location of New York City. It's also a horror game based on a concept in a novel with the same name. It acts as a sequel to it, actually. The combat in Parasite Eve is like a mix of real-time and turn-based, and it's pretty unique and fun. The game is also really short and can be beaten in about 10 hours or so, making this one a great one to replay around Halloween. July of that year would bring us the action RPG, Brave Fencer Musashi. Brave Fencer Musashi! This was a really colorful game with silly food-based puns and a super charming art style. Squaresoft had kind of built a reputation for making more mature themed games, for the most part. Brave Fencer Musashi was definitely not that, and I think they knew this and didn't want to alienate some of those fans, which is why they decided to include a demo of the yet-to-be-released Final Fantasy VIII with it. Smart move for sure, as I'm sure that only helped boost sales. Standing on its own merits, I thought Brave Fencer Musashi was a pretty fun little game. It was ahead of its time in many ways, with a day and night cycle and some voiced-over dialogue. Yeah, but a nasty spell has been cast in Meandering Forest and it won't be easy to find the graveyard. So, take my boy Leno. It's one I haven't talked about on the channel a whole lot, as I haven't played it in like, 20 years, seriously, but I have been meaning to go back and replay it these days. The last game we would get that year would be Chocobo's Dungeon 2. Unlike the first one, this one did actually receive a North American release. Again, it's a cute little roguelike with Final Fantasy characters. I did play this one as a kid, but not a whole lot, so not much to say here. Before we move on to the final year of the decade, let me just preface it by saying, 1999 was an absolutely insane year, and in my opinion, the best year of development the company ever had. And with as amazing as their output has been, you know that's saying a lot. I mean, they really could not have ended the decade on a better note. To start that year, we got Final Fantasy VIII in February. While this one scored really high upon release, I know it's a bit of a polarizing title to fans these days. The story and characters can be a little disjointed, but it's mainly the junction and draw system that really seems to be hit or miss with people. Regardless of how you personally feel about them, I think it's safe to say that it's pretty damn broken, considering you can break the game entirely in like the first disc. With that said, it does make it pretty fun to replay and abuse. One of the most fun Final Fantasy titles to replay for that reason. Plus, it also gave us Triple Triad, the addicting card game, which was always a good time. Gameplay aside, the music was also absolutely incredible, and in my opinion, Nobuo Oimatsu's best work in the Final Fantasy series, and the CGI cutscenes were fucking fantastic. I mean, come on, the opening cutscene? So damn epic. Definitely a huge step up from Final Fantasy VII, and the graphics as a whole, really. The characters weren't so blocky this time, and were a little more realistically proportioned. In retrospect, Final Fantasy VIII may not be heralded quite as highly as some other titles in the series, but it's still an extremely fun game with some really high highs. On August 1st, Saga Frontier 2 would come out. Saga Frontier 2 is a super gorgeous game with beautiful, hand-drawn, watercolored graphics. It's got a really unique aesthetic to it and one of the prettiest styles on the entire system. Something that I didn't appreciate as a kid, but I definitely do now. There are two separate storylines you can play as in this game, 
each with different characters. While it's still a fairly non-linear game overall, this one was a bit more linear than all the previous saga titles before it. To be honest though, despite me always thinking the box art looked really cool as a kid, this is one that I never played that much either. I've neglected the Saga series more than I probably should. I really just need to stop being a bitch and check these out. On the topic of gorgeous games though, Legend of Mana would come out a few months later on July 15th. This was the newest entry in the Mana series and easily the most unique one out of them all. The hand-drawn backgrounds are so vivid and vibrant and colorful. It's such a beautiful style and in my opinion, the best part about the game next to the music. I gotta admit though, while the visuals and soundtrack are absolutely top notch and easily some of the best on the entire PlayStation, I never played this one that much back in the day either as its non-linear gameplay just kind of confused me. It's a very ambitious game with a lot of freedom to do whatever you want, for better or for worse. Some people love that aspect and others, not so much. The fact that you're locked out of certain characters and events based on what you do, with really no way of knowing this, just kinda low-key gave me anxiety. I know for some people that's the magic of it, as each playthrough is different and you don't know what you're gonna get, but I'm the type of person who checks missable guides before starting RPGs to make sure I don't screw myself out of anything, so it's just pretty hard for me. I do need to learn to shake that mindset though, as I'm sure there's a great time to be had here. A couple months later on September 2nd, Front Mission 3 would be released. And finally, we actually got it in North America this time. Like the previous two numbered titles, Front Mission 3 was also a tactical RPG involving mechs. There's a lot of customization, strategic gameplay, a mature story, and yeah, it's a quality game. I think the success of Final Fantasy Tactics played a pretty big role in getting this one localized. It showed them that there was a market for these types of games after all. Honestly, I really love tactical and strategy RPGs and wish we got more of them these days. At the end of the month, the bundle of games, Final Fantasy Anthology, would be released. This was just a collection of games featuring Final Fantasy V and Final Fantasy VI. There was nothing really new added though, besides some CGI cutscenes in the opening and closing segments. It was also the first time that North America saw Final Fantasy V localized, so that was pretty cool. A couple weeks later on October 14th, the cute little action RPG, Threads of Fate, would come out. It's a very simple and charming game where you get the choice to play as one of two main characters. It's a pretty short game overall, so you can beat both scenarios fairly quickly. I wouldn't say this one's quite as up there as most of other Squaresoft's RPGs on the PS1, but it's still a pretty fun experience. The next game they would release on November 18th though, now in my opinion, that would be one of Squaresoft's best games ever, and one of the best RPGs on the PS1. Of course, the game in which I'm referring to is the stunningly gorgeous title, Chrono Cross. With as many video games as I've played over the years, this is a pretty bold statement, but Chrono Cross just might have my favorite visual aesthetic out of any video game of all time. That tropical fantasy atmosphere is just so damn pretty and awe-inspiring to traverse through. It's just such a unique setting and something we really haven't got a whole lot of in RPGs, except for maybe Final Fantasy X, another favorite of mine. But yeah, all the environments and pre-rendered backgrounds are just so beautiful to look at. It just does such a great job of immersing me in and sparking my imagination. Speaking of pre-rendered backgrounds though, it's something I really haven't touched on in this video a whole lot, but let me just say, Squaresoft absolutely killed these on the PlayStation and is a large part of what makes the graphics in games like Chrono Cross and Final Fantasy 7 through 9 so memorable and immersive. These hold up so damn well to this day, much better than the character models of course. Sometimes I'll find myself looking at high resolution screenshots of some of these backgrounds and just being blown away by the artistic direction. You can just tell there was so much time, effort, and heart put into them. But yeah, that was a long enough tangent, so let's get back to Chrono Cross. On the topic of graphics, I guess it would be a shame if I didn't bring up the CGI cutscenes right now. These were sprinkled in at various moments through the game and really made some scenes feel epic. By far the most epic one though didn't come from the game itself, but the opening movie from the game. If you played this as a kid, I can guarantee that your mind was just blown the first time you saw this. Obviously the CGI itself looks incredible, but the slow buildup of the music over the mystical text in the poem, leading into a high energy blend of various instruments just sits so damn perfectly.
the timing, the way it all flows together, it's just done so well and really makes you feel like you're about to embark on an epic adventure. The song and CGI movie were already amazing enough on their own, but combine them together and you have a real masterpiece. What's also a masterpiece though is just the music in general. My favorite OST out of any JRPG ever, and perhaps just my favorite period. Yasunori Matsuda just fucking killed this to the point where even people that aren't a fan of the game will at least acknowledge how amazing the music is. The greatness is just undeniable. The upbeat tracks are catchy, the somber, slower pieces are so poignant and beautiful, and yeah, it's just incredible. So many scenes are just elevated because of it. I know that Chrono Cross may not have been the ideal sequel to Chrono Trigger that some fans were hoping for, and even I'll admit, it does get pretty damn convoluted near the end, plus the 40 plus playable characters just takes away some development they could have given to the main cast, but if you don't judge it as a sequel to Chrono Trigger and instead just judge it as its own thing, then there's an extremely memorable experience to be had here. And yeah, with Chrono Cross, that essentially marked Squaresoft's last RPG of the 90s. Parasite Eve 2 technically did come out in December, but that one was a lot different from the first game and not so much a JRPG, and more like a survival horror game instead. Even though the 90s were officially over, Squaresoft would still give us a few more classics before they merged with Enix in 2003. Games like Vagrant Story and Final Fantasy IX came out for the original PlayStation in 2000, the latter of which being a fantastic swan song for the console, and games like Final Fantasy X and Kingdom Hearts would come out for the PS2 the following years, with Final Fantasy X-2 on March 2003 being their last official title before the merger with Enix. All great games in their own rights, and I would love to talk about Final Fantasy IX and X more, but the title of the video is Squaresoft in the 90s, so our time ends here. Both are my favorite Final Fantasies though, and we've shown them a good amount of love on the channel before. Final Fantasy IX is referenced a lot in our videos about cozy ends in JRPGs and prologues in JRPGs, and FF10 is heavily featured in our video about beaches in JRPGs, and to a lesser extent in our Top 10 Tropical Towns video, so those are some good vids to check out if you want to see some more on those titles. For now though, it's a wrap on this video. But not before one last statement. Thank you Squaresoft for blessing us with these timeless classics. Their magical journeys did wonders for my creativity and imagination and helped shape me into the person that I am today. So many priceless childhood memories. Alright, now that's really a wrap this time. Thanks a bunch for watching everyone, we hope you enjoyed it. If you did, it would mean a lot if you could either hit that like button, or even consider subscribing to the channel if you haven't already. And hey, if you're feeling extra generous and really want to help support the growth of our channel, it's by no means expected, but please consider donating to our Patreon. This was our longest video yet, and needless to say, making content like this takes a lot of time and effort, and still being a smaller and newer channel, we're not really making that YouTube money yet, so any donation, no matter how small, is greatly appreciated, and really does a lot to help our channel grow, so we can keep putting videos out in a timely manner. Again, just to reiterate though, it's by no means expected, and we're happy just to have you here watching. But yeah, how do you guys feel about Squaresoft RPGs and what are some of your favorite memories associated with them? Let us know in the comments below. As always, just want to give a huge thanks to our Patreon supporters. We seriously can't thank you enough for all your generosity. It's very much appreciated. Other than that, thanks again for watching everyone and hope you have an awesome day. This is Corbin from Gaming Productions. Until next time.